However, the need for compliance tracking and provenance in the pharmaceutical and medical equipment sector is now more evident than ever. You'll recollect the issue of counterfeit face masks has been highlighted repeatedly in recent months. Now, the ideas raised last year in the CSIRO Data61 and UNSW presentation on blockchain solutions for traceability and trust management supply chains appear particularly applicable to the issues that we're seeing now that relate to our own resilience. Trust is a quality in short supply in many instances today. A technology that can improve supply chain resilience without the need to presuppose trust in a foreign government or business entity would prove invaluable. It's something that we really need. So where should we focus? The discussion of smart sovereignty and trusted supply chains has emerged during the pandemic is an opportunity possibly to reframe a part of the blockchain discussion. Priority is likely going to be afforded to critical infrastructure areas such as communications, energy, healthcare, transport systems, banking and financial services, food and agriculture, and of course, information technology. Given the current focus on medicine and medical equipment supply chains, targeting this domain could provide an opportunity to highlight the significant benefits of blockchain technologies. Getting the wider public to understand what the hell that is, that's another challenge. Now, what I'm gonna talk about now is the broader issues of national resilience and what we're looking at. Adapting some of the narrative that I'm gonna cover might help explain the potential of blockchain to improve our resilience. It might be useful to you. So where to as a country? Our resilience has to be addressed by individuals, communities, businesses, and all levels of government. It's about being better prepared and having the ability and will to act collaboratively wherever possible. We've got to make sure that resilience is not perceived as an inconvenience or a cost that gets in the way of living. It is an inherent essential part of living in the modern world. Of course, our resilience is interdependent with that of our regional neighbors. So we need to address also not how we look just after our resilience, but how do we help our neighbors improve theirs? So this interdependent partnership will be a foundation for building resilient and trusted supply chains. And it's not just a matter of the supply chains that we receive should be trusted. We have to demonstrate and show to countries that will depend upon us, not only for day-to-day -day trade, but in a crisis that we can be trusted as well. So that technology has to apply. Uh, I note last year's discussion of uh, verifying uh, and having trusted supply chains in meat exports is a good example of that. So what are we doing in the Institute I chair? We're working on a national resilience project in collaboration with another think tank in Sydney, Global Access Partners. <clears throat> What we're trying to do is to make a contribution to the conversation we're going to have to have in Australia and offer some constructive suggestions on where we as a nation need to head when we emerge from the pandemic crisis sometime next year, we hope. The challenge we're going to face then is building the next generation economy, more resilient societal systems, and thus improved sovereignty and security. So a couple of key things are, are coming out in our project. The first is you can't be resilient and prepared unless you've done a comprehensive risk and vulnerability analysis. And so we're gonna take that home affairs profiling Australia's vulnerability report and try and expand that a little bit to look at unnatural disasters. We have to identify what are the sovereign capabilities, knowledge and skills with which we have to have a degree of self-reliance in a time of crisis like we're going through now. And also, where is it prudent to be able to guarantee a degree of domestic supply? We then have to look at the critical supply chains that will be depending on global sourcing and how are we gonna make those trusted, transparent and verifiable. Those capabilities of systems also, which open glass supply chains should be maintained and encouraged, but aren't necessary to have the same trust level. I don't need to guarantee that T-shirt coming in on time. But what we're calling for is to develop an integrated national sovereignty or resilience framework, strategy and action plan based on that risk analysis that addresses what is critical to our way of life and the functioning of our society and then determines how to build it. This will take time and it will cost us, but we're gonna to have to convince the Australian public. If we keep going for the lowest cost, take critical supply chains offshore, lose our skill sets, 
then in a major crisis, the price is something that we don't want to bear. Now, implementing the plan is going to be a challenge because it will take an integrated model, collaboration across all levels of government, industry, the public and private sectors and community organisations. Now, we've seen a very good example of how that's worked to date in managing the early phase of the pandemic. How to take that model of cooperation and apply it into the future is going to be a challenge. But we're going to have to face reality. We can't, for example, isolate ourselves or quarantine ourselves from the global economy. So even though we can do that to a degree for the pandemic, we're going to have to face the reality of dealing that hopefully a vaccine emerges. But in the way that we're going to have to deal with the economic crisis, we can't quarantine ourselves. It's not going to go away. And we're going to have to face that reality. What can you do? I think in the industry sector you're in, you've got a technology that could certainly be a key player in looking at that trusted supply chain area. And that is something we're going to have to find. Now, it's going to be a real challenge for the political system to address this because it's often hard for a politician to go, hey, here are risks and vulnerabilities. Because some smart character in the media will go, why haven't you fixed it? Well, you haven't fixed it because the world's a complicated place and we've been caught by surprise. We Australians need to insist that our politicians do address this. We can't be truly resilient unless we're prepared and we can't be prepared unless we take an honest look at our risks and vulnerabilities. So a paper that covers what I've said today is on the website and I'm happy to take any questions if uh, you want to do that, Peter. Thank you. Um, for sure, for sure. And um, thank you, thank you. So before we go any further. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for those who are not familiar with um, Zoom, there is a reactions um, thing where you actually can clap without um, making lots of noise if you want to do it that way too. Um, so, yeah, so are there any questions for John? I'll throw one out. John, I know blockchain technologies are relatively new and they're relatively new to you. But one of the most interesting areas of exploration in the technology doesn't have to do with the technology itself, but the social ramification of the technology. And that is being able to create a technical environment in which the system itself is uncheatable. You might be able to uh, cheat the on-ramps, but the underlying technologies have, have not been broken to date, uh, and that's by design. This allows us to set up uh, systems of social trust where before uh, social trust was hard to come by. Certainly in the current world, social trust is often hard to come by. the technology community is telling the supply chain community that this is an opportunity because supply chains are full of people who don't know each other, don't trust each other, have economic incentives not to trust each other, have economic incentives not to trust the central authority, um, don't even necessarily uh, wish to trust national authorities. And, and national authorities aren't necessarily central to the supply chain. So it seems to us that there's a natural fit here, but we always run into these uh, chicken and egg issues where sometimes technology is, a, is a, a notional solution to a problem, but it's not a practical solution to the problem because of uh, politics or uh, it, it, extending existing financial interests or what have you. So with all of that uh, said, where do you think the opportunities lie for things like supply chain management through ports? And where do you think Australia is uh, um, challenged 
in taking up that kind of new technology in front of countries like the United States or the UK or Canada or other places where we typically uh, bought uh, solutions that have been proven elsewhere? I think your opportunity in this whole area is because we're in a crisis. Australians tend to be a bit too complacent. So until you get a crisis, yeah, she'll be right. Don't worry about it. We've had it good for 30 years. It's not a problem. And that then bleeds through our political level. I think what we're seeing right now is a fundamental loss in confidence uh, and a fear factor that's visceral. So we're reacting pretty well, but trying to solve the longer term problem is going to be a challenge. So if you had this conference last year, what I'd say to you is the chance of hooking this into a, a public narrative that explains to people the significance of this would have been much harder last year than it's going to be now and next year. So I think you've got the opportunity to put it out there because the expectations of our politicians dealing with this right now are fairly unrealistic. You see what's happening in Victoria. They now want to hang the PM, the, the uh, Premier, which is crazy. When we see the next stages of the rest of the supply chain problems, because we haven't got to the bottom of those, and we see the problems in getting the vaccine and the global distribution because someone like America buys everything up, then this is going to create a huge emotional surge in the country. So the opportunity is there to highlight where the technology fits. The challenge you're going to have is being able to tell the story, the narrative in simple English that somebody who doesn't have a technical background can understand because I think you need to create an understanding that your technical solution to this is fundamental to having more resilient and trusted supply chains. The prime minister was using the trusted supply chain language in parliament two weeks ago. I'm sure he doesn't know what it means, but he was using it. So I think the opportunity is there. You're gonna face the challenge that every other deep technical expert has. You don't speak English. So you're going to probably need some allies who are storytellers, narratives, people from the arts area, to try and put this into a simple story, that this is what the world looked like today and why we're having these problems and why you've got counterfeiting of drugs. I'd particularly pay up on the medicines one because that is a visceral problem for people today. And you tell the story, this is why you've got a problem. Now, here's a picture of the world in two years time or a year's time. That with these types of technologies, this is what the difference it makes to that mother who's about to put a pill or a drug down a child's throat, to that sick individual who's about to take a medicine or someone who needs a critical medical treatment. You need to put that story out there and what a difference it can make that whilst there are still problems, having an ability to have transparent and trusted supply chains changes this dynamic. We're far better off than our neighbors. I think a study that was done about Papua New Guinea's drug area 40, I think, percent of basically their drugs uh, were either unusable or counterfeit. Now, thankfully, we're far better than that here, but there are counterfeit drug problems going on. Even in Australia, our distribution of temperature controlled drugs is problematical. I know of a study in the Northern Territory that a significant proportion of the temperature controlled drugs and vaccine are not maintained at that temperature during distribution. And therefore, they're not going to be effective when they're used. You have the technology that with the appropriate sensors can help us track things like that. So crisis is the opportunity. Fear is going to be the motivating factor from the public. Your challenge is to turn your story into a narrative that can be understood. It can even be talked you know, by the, the talkback radio hosts. We'll say we've got to do something about this. Uh, but I think it's the time is about right where they might listen. Thank you. Thank you, John. Are there any other questions? Not a problem. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, as I said, I've certainly learned something in reading about last year's conference and some of your preparations in here, I think you've got an important uh, message to be able to sell. So good luck with sending it. It's taken Sorry. me you know, the last seven years to try and get the message out there about fuel security. It's not an easy journey. 
but I think it's an important one for you. Sorry, John, before you go, we've actually got um, someone who'd like to pose a question. Sly has got his, raised his hand um, to ask a question. So Sly, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I wasn't sure if we should be putting our hand up to ask questions or, or what. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, do you have any more information on the actual effects of the supply chain vulnerability? Because things like toilet paper is quite silly. Because if you went to the shop early in the morning, every morning they would restock it, right? So that was just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but like I was going early in the morning, there were always stuff there. Um, but like, do you know of any deaths that have occurred from being unable to purchase medicine or from taking counterfeit drugs? I'm not sure what you mean by counterfeit. Do you mean like drugs that are actually made out of baking soda or something? Yeah, so there's an Australian manufacturer up in Sydney Pharmaceuticals uh, they are making pretty much bespoke uh, specific ones for export. They have found counterfeit medicines. So medicines that don't have the proper ingredients in them, packaged up, put in their package and being sold in Asia. So that's one example. The other problem then comes is quality control. So back in, I think 2008, it might've been or nine, there was a drug called heparin that was being produced out of China. It's uh, an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, and it's essential for operations. What had happened, it's made from pig intestines and there was contamination in the, in the uh, pig farming in China. It eventually made its way into the drug. Testing wasn't done properly. I think it was about a thousand deaths or something like that happened in the US. And a lot of people were seriously ill from it. And so there are plenty of examples of contamination in the chain that doesn't get detected and people start dying. In Australia, I went to one of the big medicine lobby groups and said, I'm a bit concerned from what I'm reading. Now with our Institute, we have doctors and fellows there. We're running a health study as a part of our national resilience project with about 20 health professionals. These are from the pharmaceutical industry, from hospital pharmacists, doctors, surgeons, academics. And there is a concern about how you validate it. But when I spoke to one of the industry representatives, they said to me, well, if there was a problem in Australia, we'd be seeing deaths. So the fact that we haven't got deaths identified to a drug, Therefore, there's no problem with testing. And I thought at first they must have come from the bloody tobacco industry by telling me that because there is a problem, according to our doctors, with inadequate testing. So we take a lot on faith. We can test within Australia and we do sample testing, but nowhere near enough. So, yes, there are examples of overseas of deaths. Uh, there are known shortages that are critical. We ran out of EpiPens and EpiPen juniors about a year and a bit ago. Try telling a parent that there's no EpiPen junior for their child who's got you know, a, a potential uh, life-threatening allergy problem. So right now, when I last checked, we had 580 medicines in short supply on the TGA list and 70 or 80 of those were critical ones, critical for our health. So is there data about deaths that resulted from it? No, there are a number of cases in that, that's for Australia. There are a number of cases overseas for it. And you can see something. So when you look at the report online, I referred to our institute. If you go to that website, we have a report there, which is about Australia's medicine supply chain, using a lot of analysis out of the US. So you can get some examples. There is no shortage globally of reports about contamination and counterfeiting of drug supplies. And being in mind that we're 90% import dependent, that's a problem for us. In addition, we don't mandate minimum stock holdings. So whatever the industry decides to do, we do. If you are in Finland, they mandate between three and 10 months of medicine stocks for 1,457 medicines. Now, the varying time depends on their shelf life and they pay industry to hold those stocks. So if you have a supply chain interruption, you know you've got somewhere between three and 10 months of supply before it gets critical. The other issue for us is not just quality of medicines, or counterfeiting or anything else like that. It's understanding the supply chain. What is happening in the supply chain? Is there a disruption? How might this impact us? We do not have a model of our medicine supply chain, so we don't understand it. If we can get that and then verify it and also have visibility of the supply chain, I think your technologies pay into a key part there. If you haven't got the information about the supply chain, then an interruption will come as a surprise for a country that doesn't mandate stock holdings, it's going to come as a dangerous surprise. I and mean, right now, the shortages of the drugs, 
that we need to run a ventilator, an intubation ventilator, is significant. We may have gone from 2,200 ventilators to 4,500 and we're heading up beyond that. But a TGA study said that if we could get 25% more of those three critical drugs than we did last year before the pandemic, we could treat 200 COVID patients a month on top of normal surgeries. What's the point of having 4,500 ventilators if you haven't got visibility of the key drugs you need to use them? That's the situation we're in. So there's a whole bunch of dimensions and data to justify this. And the examples there for you to be able to tell your story uh, are, are plentiful. All right. So thank you, John, um, for answering those questions. So if you've got further questions for John, I encourage you to go to the Slack channel and um, discuss there. So Alicia, you're on the call, I believe. I'm here. Okay. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome. So I'll, I'll give you a very quick introduction. Um, mm -hmm. So Alicia Felsaron, and I hope I haven't destroyed your name there. But, um, <laughs> Alicia um, is the Managing Director of Fixed Income and Head of Sustainable Investment at Pinebridge Investments. Um, she's done many things. She's been to Harvard, not Harvard, Stanford and MIT. <laughs> yeah, and she's um, been a author of, a co-author of more than one book which is very impressive, um, very impressive. So I will hand it over to you. I'll share your slides for you so that um, Thank you. I, they will be shared and I'll give you control as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, David, Sandra, of course, and, and the team at Consensus. Uh, hold on one second, I think I got interrupted here. Uh, there you go. You should have control now. Okay, let me see if I do. Uh, I may Click need, in. I may need to ask you actually if some some somehow my system um <laughs> if you don't mind, uh do you mind Peter? If uh, No, I'll do it. It's okay, I'll do it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Not a problem that at all. Happens, right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Awesome, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, again, as I was saying, um, Peter, David, Sandra, um, and all the team at Consensus, thank you for having me join the discussion today. And greetings to you all from New York, as, as uh, Peter mentioned, so good evening uh, for me. Um, a little bit about my background on, on top of what you know, Peter just shared that um, I'll describe what sustainable and responsible investment means and how it is relevant not only in supply chain and supply chain data, but to build towards a sustainable future in the recovery planning post COVID uh, and what it means during our conversation. Nevertheless, uh, what I wanted to tell uh, the community today uh, at the supply chain on blockchain conference is that I'm a firm believer that technology will play a significant role in the coming years to build tools that really leverage the right set of data. And as John was just mentioning, what is that kind of data and where is the narrative behind that? In this case, um, the question I'm addressing with you today is, um, it comes from the lens of financial institutions and how will financial institutions integrate the environmental and social impact of products that they invest in uh, starting from existing supply chain dynamics that as we heard from John, um, clearly are context dependent, country dependent, but they, you know, COVID has shown us how they're all so intertwined. So um, the second part of the discussion, I will make sure to highlight why uh, blockchain solution develop developers should actually pay attention to, uh, to all of this. So uh, we have 20 minutes together. Uh, the first half of the time um, I will devote to discuss big picture sort of view. Um, and the urgent need really to design a sort of smarter and stronger and more diverse supply chain has been clearly one of the main lessons uh, of the pandemic. But uh, we will view both procurement and trade and now they have shifted gears dramatically. 
But also the important focus is another lens, and again, the investor lens like myself, which are increasingly during COVID looking at transparent, traceable, comparable, environmental and social factors within supply chains and how that is likely to create severe headwinds to supply chain design unless technology solutions are actually built with an eye on investors' insights. And the, the evidence I will bring comes from the natural rubber supply chain and how that has evolved or has been affected during COVID, which I think um, you will find very interesting. Then the second half of this session, we will be discussing um, how uh, blockchain developers can help bring both clarity, but also commercial solutions to the issue of how responsible investors will, will continue to need to manage supply chain risk top down, as opposed to how it's currently done, which is bottom up, so led by provenance. But let, let's get to that, you know, in, in a moment. Um, David, if, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, next. Um, so we just, uh, you know, if we think for a moment of, of the procurement lens and how COVID has turned all the supply chain of basic commodities and other goods upside down, um, for me, the, the way to describe procurement lens from the investor perspective is that I continue to see a bumpy road of supply and demand shock. Um, clearly, if we had to go back, and this is just a, a short uh, snapshot of the situation between January and April uh, of this year, but when we're thinking about all multinational corporations, clearly uh, they faced an initial supply shock. Then we have had a demand shock as more and more countries obviously had over people to stay home. Um, and then you've had governments and businesses and individual consumers basically struggling to procure basic products and materials. By the way, creating bottlenecks uh, due to the attempts to procure outside of the traditional and established networks. And, and that has been an underlying uh, pro problem about sort of a gray market for procurement, right? Uh, the data I like to refer to is from TradeShift, uh, fully available on the web, is a, a global platform for supply chain man management, and it, it really looks at the magnitude of impact on both trade and demand, which has led uh, the bottlenecks that I'm showing in this chart. Um, again, I'm showing the US, UK, and the EU, and, and how uh, that uh, followed a, a, an initial drop of 26% at the very beginning of April. Um, but that is on the back of China and now China domestic and internal trade transactions suffered a, a significant drop week over week, almost 50% uh, drop beginning mid-February. Now, when we look at the US, UK and Europe, by the time that bottlenecks in procurement hit China, it took almost seven to eight weeks to get to the US, to the UK and to the EU. So, we have to keep that in mind when we think about the broader commodity cycle. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, we said there's two sides, right, of the contraction. Uh, and one we address is, is procurement with all this bumpy road of supply and demand. And then on the other hand, there is just trade on itself, right? Uh, number one, two side effects of the contraction in trade, in global trade has been number one, it takes longer to settle an invoice, and that's purely in economic terms, right? We hit um, faster payments across the procurement cycle right before the crisis on a year-over-year -year basis. So global supply chains, when they got to the end of 2019, were actually settling average businesses 36.7 days to settle an invoice, which was huge if we just look year-over-year -year or three-year time. Now in the first quarter of 2020, that average payment turn has basically risen up, adding two to three days to that for an invoice just to settle. Now add to that that the lack of orders that were coming through the supply chains that obviously has exacerbated that trend and new orders were slowing down and invoices also dropping off. So when we take a look at that, Clearly, we have an essential takeaway just by looking at China alone and when the lockdown in Wuhan was lifted. Factories may be reopening, but consumers aren't buying. And so that, that's essential. Because the third point here is also um, the concept of reputation, right? China's reputation as the factory of the world. 
Um, why is it causing problems? Because many of the country's trading partners have remained in lockdown. And China's economy is predominantly fifth or fifth of their GDP is exports. So orders are flatlining still in the US. Other key trade partners like the UK and many of the European bloc countries are also in the same trend. So it is really doubtful at the moment whether China can orchestrate a recovery of the supply chain and trade purely on its own terms. And that's essential regardless of the country where you're sitting. So clearly what happened then, you know, it becomes a, a choice between self-preservation and, and supplier solvency, right? For many of the multinational companies. And the reality of this crisis then has presented this dark choice, right? Between meeting your quarter, uh, meeting your, your own financials, and instead making sure that your suppliers, at least in the tier one mode, are actually solvent. Uh, in the US, we've had the case, for example, of Unilever, where their US subsidiary pledged to pay their suppliers early, very early on this year. Now, not all consumer products companies have done that. And, you know, we, we don't really know what the future um, will, will look like. Um, next slide, please. Now, but let's think about post-pandemic for a second, right? Let, let's, let's go on, on a little bit of positive. What has gone up, and this chart is, is, is impressive to me, COVID has been a turning point for people that are operating in my field, responsible investors. Responsible investors that are driving the next generation of investment flows, and they rely on the impact of environmental and social practices to address the value of trade. What does that mean? It means that sustainability-focused investors have attracted a record amount of capital at the same time that you have had all these issues in supply, all these issues in demand, all these issues in the value of trade globally. And in the first quarter of this year, they have raised almost 56 billion of new money put to work in funds that are looking to invest in environmental and social leaders across the globe or to stay away from environmental and social losers in a way. And again, there are a variety of ways in which investors implement these strategies globally. But when you think about the global capital markets, we have seen an outflow of almost 400 billion at the same time, while sustainable funds have flown in 46 billion in their pockets. Where are they coming from, right? Well, 80% of that has gone to index funds. These are funds that utilize data to build their strategies. And here I go back to supply chains. Data is a key driver of growth and access to information for these investors. And these investors, as John has referenced before, they, they're not gonna be able to quarantine themselves from economic recovery. And clearly economic recovery that are based on procurement and are based on trade are for the most part driven by supply chain health and sustainability. Next slide, please. Now, but again, let, let's, let's go back to, to discuss how is sustainable investing linked to supply chains, right? Okay, so we have two sides, right? I, I tried here to, to, to show in a way a supply chain, you know, on the left you'll find all the activities that are, are found in developed markets and, and on the right side in emerging markets. So th think about Think about the two parts of the world. On the left, you have developed markets. So where 70% of companies, and you have from Fortune 500 to smaller uh, companies and private companies, 70% of these companies struggle with product lifecycle management decisions in their products or in their services. So these are decisions that are surrounding what product to place in which shelf for how long and when to restock or substitute on the shelf as products or services. Now, on the other hand, emerging markets rely for 90% emerging market countries are dependent from procurement and from the procurement cycle of developed economies. So again, we discussed China's example, if we're thinking about manufacturers or even uh, engineer pro goods and other markets for commodities, right? So both developed economies and emerging economies are suffering as a result of the headwinds in procurement and trade during COVID. Yet they are both seeing a surge in responsible investment funds and practices. Okay, that's great. 
Because in addition to the environmental focus that, that we see in the headlines, many of these funds having, the emphasis on corporate responsibilities toward all stakeholders, which include employees and suppliers, is likely to grow. And I, and I want to really stress the, the, the suppliers' um, role here. This is not a trend. This is sustainable business practices are here to stay. And I'm here to say in what terms? In terms of traceability and accountability of goods and services, in terms of how that is connected to environmental and social footprint of the goods that are transported or are transferred in the procurement cycle, and also in the merging certifications that are linked to obviously auditing standards, and, and they are more and more becoming a norm. Next slide, please. Now, I'll give you a quick example that I've, that I've um, had during, during the month of April um, in the natural rubber ecosystem and in the natural rubber market. Um, and I'll show you how it's an example of disruptive forces at play. Now, during the pandemic, uh, natural rubber, small holders and plantations that are mainly in Southeast Asia, um, in Africa and in Latin America, suffer from a, a heat in demand in a commodity market that when COVID hit um, was mainly driven by the use of, of rubber in tire manufacturing. So highly correlated to automobile production cycle. Now keep in mind uh, COVID strikes and the natural rubber price pre-COVID had already reached an all-time low um, and it was a, a the, that was the very first decline in demand for over a 10 year cycle. Approximately for a kilo of natural rubber was hit by 1.35 US dollars per, per kilo. That before COVID. So think for a moment that you need two kilos of natural rubber to manufacture one car tire and almost three times that amount for a truck. Okay. And globally that the market is a billion tire demand per annum. Now that's interesting. Um, when you look at the use of blockchain solutions, that had not been widespread in an industry like that. Predominantly as bond holders and, and small landowners have been switching the commodity in their plantation cycle. They have been choosing very quickly to follow the highest yielding one and choosing, creating basically a lag in data that car manufacturer will have in their supply chains of natural rubber for their use in, in, in the tire that they were ordering. So that obviously had hindered comparability of information received. Now the COVID disruption, uh, particularly on the natural rubber uh, market, included you know, the travel restrictions we know, the global auto manufacturing slowdown, and then you had this lack of economic incentives to keep plantation workers maintaining natural rubber as opposed to switching, for example, to coffee beans or something else. Now, on the other hand, though, you had responsible sourcing practices that had not been put on hold during COVID. If anything, they needed intensified. So we identified emerging use cases, including medical supplies, yet seen not just headlines, but real data supplying rubber globes and the importance of you know, the demand of rubber globes. So quickly, the natural rubber that was not going into filling the demand for, for tires and, and for automobile manufacturers went into uh, medical supply, the medical supply chain. So incrementally, though, regional stakeholder initiatives started to support during COVID with local government intervention, for example, measures um, I have seen utilizing the market come from Thailand, where Thailand themselves have pledged to support demand for natural rubber by utilizing it in road construction and um, looking at an innovation like rubberized alpha, uh, uh, asphalt. And India, that um, has pledged to deploy natural rubber for the construction of um, uh, riverside uh, rubber embankments that they use. So uh, on the other hand, you had other governments that, for example, Vietnam, that have pro uh, basically proceeded to convert all the operation on natural rubber to industrial land use, um, technically not favoring that as, part, as a sustainable part of their economy, right? So, most use cases though that we see, uh, like the one in natural labor, connect the dots with the tier one suppliers, which are pre-identified and they don't go past tier one. So when you actually shut down natural labor operations because you lack, you lack data to support comparable information as shipping or, or place of provenance, you're actually only, you actually only know the tier one suppliers 
you can tell the repercussion on past tier one that you are creating. And so clearly, uh, when you take this into consideration, you also have to realize that if you're a chief procurement officer, um, probably according to Deloitte, you only have 6% of all chief procurement officers that feel that they have a good understanding of all their supply chain past tier one. And that's important. And one of the one of the use cases, obviously, as as John has, has pointed out, uh, we have seen in the U.S. is com not only combating counterfeit drugs but also medical devices, right? And the origin of the medical devices. Now, next next slide, please. So we are briefly. What are the perils? And the perils to this is investors clearly are recognizing the need that. There is a broader set of technology solutions, such as application of blockchain, obviously, but it may still be in early stages of development. So it's not a silver bullet yet. And um, you may see critics that go very broadly making statement as, you know, this is a hammer looking for nails and others instead say that it's an internet based technology and therefore um, you have a high energy use that may, you know, maybe countering, counterintuitive and, and not supplying um, the right amount of comfort to uh, sustainable investors. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the outstanding question from investors are, is blockchain still an experiment that is relegated to the process of tracking? without much to offer to companies looking instead to evaluate environmental and social risk within the supply chain, or is it ready to offer a comprehensive responsible sourcing solution, right? Um, I would say, um, next slide please, that the biggest opportunity is actually beyond traceability and beyond place of origin. And that's the biggest opportunity leading to adoption. Because the, the appeal to investors of an encrypted immutable ledger of transactions that they can access in chronological order, it's something appealing to investors. Nevertheless, what are the questions that investors are looking to answer when we need to promote additional investment in this area? Provenance needs to incorporate or start incorporating environmental and social footprint sample metrics recorded in the same fashion as a smart contract and if the footprint doesn't pass the preset standard, then somehow it gets rejected or something similar in that fashion. Um, the use of blocks to link to pricing of a commodity weighted, waiting for environmental and social behaviors is clearly relevant. And you know, the idea that, that I place out there for developers is what if a ledger provides a value that is then used to set the responsible price for the commodity itself which can fluctuate to stabilize the commodity market to a fair price for all stakeholders. Next slide, please. Now, so how can blockchain developers help? And so, sorry if I hold, held you tight for 10, 10 slides before getting here. So I'll make my prediction here. Uh, the next five years will be key for the adoption of blockchain in due diligence practices of investors. Again, the capital is there and is a growing amount. Um, has to deal with, again, environmental and social footprint of products that has to go beyond the tier one suppliers, where you have responsible sourcing that clearly will drive adoption. So capturing sourcing attributes behind what we currently have of traceability and provenance. Now, the open question is, what are these due diligence questions that investors will likely pose? They fall into three categories. First of all, uh, implementing environmental assessments. So anything that has to do with facility records, permitting, waste storage, leak detection, things like that. Human rights assessment, second category of information that would be extremely is crucial to commodities market that operate through or that can be trackable through blockchain technology like hiring, workplace environment. Think about the hazardous conditions of proof of age, accessibility, right? And training and the capability building. What is the company doing, right? In terms of um, ensuring that, you know, environmental and human assessments are actually taking place. Now, I leave you with the idea that currently blockchain works from the bottom up of the supply chain, right? From traceability up to the finished product. So verifying the source of each component. But what is missing is the ability to manage the top down. So assessing the environmental and social business practices of, of suppliers, where you start with your direct suppliers and then cascade down your supply chain. 
So that allows that to map out all the supply chain while minimizing the supplier risk. The elements of trust, obviously, that are inherent of in blockchain uh, technology will help brands tell their story. So when we're thinking about the narrative and how the narrative is, is important, um, and that story will obviously has to resonate on environmental and social terms with customers. And in many cases, the kind of questions investors are asking clearly are not designed for storing on blockchain ledgers, but I believe a hybrid probably blockchain and traditional tool approach will likely be optimal in the future. Thank you. And I would open up for questions. Thank you. Um, and um, yes, let's all use our clap emojis. Um, so thank you very much. Are there any questions? And the last slide is my email, if you want to put in there as well. So. All right, I better reshare. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So, are there any questions? Okay. Thank I've. You. So I've got a question though. I've got a question. So all of the, I mean, in, in the first slide there, there were all these, uh, or first few slides, there were these um, roller coaster of supply and demand shocks happening. Do you think that as, um, you know, so in, a, in the USA, which is where you live, so at the moment, I think Florida has got the highest daily total you know, and I mean, at some point, assuming you can keep the testing up, maybe the US will have half a million a day, you know, new cases or something crazy like that. Will will that slow demand down more or will people just get you get um, oblivious to the number of cases and just keep on as life as if it, nothing's happening? And will will the supply and demand just level out? What do you think is going to happen? It's interesting. I, I think not only is it unpredictable, I, I, I would say that people are already starting in this process of being oblivious to what is happening. This is the unfortunate reality we live in. Uh, uh, clearly, there has to be, there has been a dramatic push by the current administration on keeping domestic supply chain open. Uh, without uh, probably putting too much effort in securing the, the international supply chain. Um, obviously, uh, that would be a terrible roadblock going forward. Um, the US nor any other country can afford to be a, a government of its own and, and not having any trade relationship with anyone. Um, you know, when, when you go uh, back on the pharmacy shelves, all I found masks are made in China. Okay, uh, now you find that in every single pharmacy, right? From, and they're very fancy and sophisticated, five layers, five please, and there are kid size and all of it, right? So we are dependent on that. Those masks and every new product that is on the shelf at a regular pharmacy in New York City is not made in the US necessarily, right? It's not made necessarily in Canada or other countries. So I think the current state of the world obviously is not something that people think is gonna be, um, I believe people think it's temporary. Now, um, I think the consumer is not necessarily realizing um, how much their inability to keep the invoicing up, right? And ordering, right? To make sure that obviously who they order from keeps an invoice up is as important to keep their access continuous to that particular good, right? Um, there's been a lot of grassroots, um, obviously movements, right? Locally to make sure that uh, local businesses would make it very um, apparent, right, to their customers. If you don't order, you know, we won't be in business, right? I don't think necessarily that the U.S. consumer or to that respect uh, any consumer in developed economies has clearly identified, you know, that, uh, that dependence on, on supply chains. Um, and that's essential. If we think about, you know, John's um, example of Finland, uh, that's pretty interesting. I can tell you my anecdotal evidence in February, uh, so China was what at the two month or not even seven week of, of shutdown. 
Uh, in February, I tried to refill a regular drug that you can find at a, at a, at a groceries for a groceries or pharmacy for headache. And they didn't have it, and they claimed that it was due to you know Chinese um, supply chains being shut down. So that's pretty telling. It was immediate. Yeah, just in time, medication is not what you want. No. Are there any other questions? Uh, Peter, yes, Peter. we've got one in, in the chat from Tyler. Tyler, do you want to just um, ask Alicia? Yeah, sure. Um, great, great chat. Thank you so much. Um, so my question is, have you seen anyone successfully tackle the top-down cascading approach so, uh, so, so immediately needs? No, and that's where is the market opportunity and where that's where I'm uh, speaking to you all today. Uh, I think it's essential to drive that. Uh, it is what will drive those 40 billion a quarter being allocated in the right places to the right companies and to the right commodity markets. So that's important and essential. Um, multinational corporations are realizing that they need that. If you start looking at the disclosure of even consumer you know, products companies and the difference in that disclosure on their supply chain in the last five years, you'd see it has gone from half a page to 10 pages long. Uh, because clearly not only there are um, you know, investors um, asking for more information, but there are consumers and consumer uh, related laws that obviously need to address the environmental and social footprint of the product sold, especially if they try to operate in countries that are very progressive, like, you know, the European bloc. Per perfect answer. And, and I was, I was half hoping you'd set me up because I'm going to be speaking a lot about exactly this and how Trium is tackling those problems uh, in five minutes. So <laughs> thank you. Awesome. awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, look, Thank you very much for joining um, in your evening, Alicia. That was really, really, um, yeah, exciting, interesting, and I've learned a lot. So um, I know you're, you're going to need to be dropping, I don't know, sometime in the next half an hour, hour or so. So hopefully you can stay to the next break, which is we're going to have a discussion um, breakout room se session. So, um, yeah. Um, but at failing that, um, please everyone um, do a LinkedIn thing with Felicia and then you'll be able to fire questions to your heart's content. Thank um, you. So now I'm going to um, the, be handing the floor over to Tyler uh, Mulverhill. Um, but before I do, I'll introduce him. So Tyler um, is, the, is a co-founder of Trium.io, which is a blockchain-based platform which helps um, businesses do essentially supply chain. So build confidence in the traceability and trackability of goods. Um, he is a, a um, chair of the supply chain working group in the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and he advises um, Fortune 500 companies and he's a CPA, which is something I didn't know, Tyler. There you go. You learn a new thing every day, even about people you've worked with for years. All right. With that, I'll hand it over to you. So, Tyler, shall I just go next? You go next slide and I'll move you along. Is that good? Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And thank you all for having me. Um, so, I guess good morning for those of, of you in, in Brisbane and Australia and that part of the world. And good evening for some of us in the US and other parts. And good afternoon to the other remote people. So, this is a, an eclectic group. I love it. Um, uh, calling in from just outside of New York, so not as bad as Florida, but I'm pretty hunkered down here, but hope everyone's safe and healthy um, in, in whatever part you're calling in from. So yeah, Peter did a great introduction. Um, I try to learn all the languages, Peter. So the language of business with accounting and the language of computers with computer science, and I don't know what I'll be onto next, Esperanza maybe, um, the language of everything, but uh, we'll, we'll see. So um, you did a good job setting me up. So I co-founded Trium.io. Uh, we'll get into really what that is, but my background's in consulting, so did a lot of um, custom supply chain application builds and that kind of uh, got the group of, of folks that were building that to say, hmm, we're, we're recognizing a pattern here. Most supply chains are a bunch of assets moving down a, a business workflow uh, that has certain people being able to do certain things. Um, and if you can abstract that and create a business tool for business users that can just, they, they already know where the supply chains are broken. They already know how uh, they need to be more agile and they can build them themselves and there, there could be real business there leveraging blockchain. So that's what we embarked upon um, about three years ago and that has turned into 
a labor of love and something that's led us on an incredible journey to kind of bring um, these, these organizations and, and companies into the, the Web3 world. So it's been incredibly exciting. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the future of sustainable supply chains, collectibles and luxury goods tokenization. So kind of an amalgamation of supply chains, which, which we typically think of as a workflow, uh, along with how that kind of moves into building a product, um, which then you can buy and trade and that kind of turns into a tokenization play. So um, I hope you know, we can learn something today and also see the world a little bit differently. If you have any questions, comments, you want to get on a, get a, get on a call in a, in a chat and ask questions and, and talk about the future, all my information is down below. Um, and I can leave you my personal email in the, uh, the chat as well. So feel free to pepper me with questions, but um, I guess next slide. All right, so um, Trium is essentially a business um, that helps businesses build trust with their consumers. So we do this by bringing traceability, transparency, and tradeability to supply chains using blockchain technology. So that's kind of our tagline, but really, why do businesses need to build trust with their consumers and their customers? Um, in my take, it, I think it's because we're now living in a trust economy. Um, it's something that we haven't really seen before, something that we haven't had to participate in, but we are, we are at the, the beginnings of what I, I, what I am labeling the trust economy because I can't think of any other way of, of thinking about or talking about what we're experiencing now other than the trust economy. Um, digital is now boring. Uh, we used to think that going from physical to digital and having a SKU number and being able to track things globally and, and having, you know, something show up on our doorstep in two days was, was the future. I don't think that is the future. I think the future is uh, not digital assets, but programmable digital assets, which really is, is something a lot different. Um, most folks, when they think about the, the difference, I think in the future, one person is going to be playing with something that is like a bundle of sticks and the other person is going to have a rocket ship at their command. Um, and, and a kind of a window into the next new world. Um, and I think that the companies that get ahead of this and start understanding how they can bring that programmability to the assets that or the products that, that folks are buying are going to be miles ahead. Um, so really unknowingly, customers are demanding uh, this digital fluency and this digital program programmability. And, uh, and you, can, you can see this in a couple different forms. So customers aren't asking folks to program things using blockchain technology. What they're asking for is, when I buy something, I want to instantaneously put it for sale with its entire provenance history. And I want to be able to sell it on Poshmark, real, real eBay. I want to sell it in one second by snapping a picture, digitally authenticating it with machine recognition image technology. And if you don't provide that, I will go to somebody who does. Um, that is going to be the future. That's going to be the future of the circular economy. That's going to be the future of how we buy and sell things. And it's just going to be the general expectation, like going to a grocery store and being able to pay with your credit card. So that's I think that's I think the future that we're living in, and so we want to be kind of the the um, the portal into Web three for these businesses to help build trust with their customers. So I think basically next de next decade is going to be about programmability and sustainable supply chains, just like Alyssa just said in the in the previous um, in the previous slide. So if we go to the next slide, Peter. All right. So if we look at a supply chain here. This is kind of our version. You're going to see probably 10 of these throughout the day, so apologies. But um, in each of the stages of supply chain, whether it's from raw materials to manufacturing and processing and, and distribution to the actual product sale and then the aftermarket, through each of these phases of a supply chain, customers are asking questions and they're demanding answers instantaneously and verifiable, they're instantaneous, and they have to be verifiable. Um, they're asking things like, my, are, the, are the raw materials uh, organic? and show me the proof points behind those claims. Are they non-GMO? During manufacturing, was this manufactured in a, in a, in a, um, in a sustainable or, or a um, uh, uh, good, manu good manufactured practice, certified good manufactured practice um, <laughs> uh, manufacturing facility? Sorry, it's a bunch of jumbled words late at night. Um, when the product is being sold, they want to know the, the uh, entire provenance and the history of that asset along the chain of custody. And the secondary sales for jerseys or art or high value luxury goods, they want to know exactly when this was um, uh, taken care of last, when it was maintained, when's the last time the watch was um, uh, cleaned, when the last time the handbag uh, was uh, certified. And all of that has to be instantaneously verifiable. So we defined really supply chains three different ways. It's through transparency, traceability, and tradability. So transparency really gives uh, businesses the ability to tell their product narrative. And what Elise was just saying is that many companies can't really even tell the simple story of backing up the claims that they're making. So show me the organic 
uh, claim, the actual physical claim that's given out to every single person, not only tier one, but all the way to tier N. How do you actually do that today? Well, it's, you know, through thousands of emails and thousands of Excel spreadsheets, and you try to integrate with ERP systems and it just doesn't work. So one of the things that Trium built is a transparency module that allows a business that wants to back up certain claims and proof points to email their, their first tier one level supplier and then have them email all of their tier um, X suppliers, have them email their tier X suppliers with certain requests. They can upload them to the blockchain. Then that can be presented eventually to the customer. So it's, it's aggregating all that information from a transparency standpoint. So it's the easiest way to do testing, inspection, and claims management on the planet. And we have customers using that right now, which I'll get to in the, in the, in the latter, latter, sides of, latter um, end of the slides. From a traceability standpoint, we talk about this in the forms of um, allowing businesses to tell your source narrative. So this is um, about item and batch level tracking and, and showing the real like history, who the farmer was, where it was, telling the story of the product. And finally, um, tradability, which is our ownership narrative. So obviously a business process doesn't have to be offer for sale, buy, sell, offer for sale, buy, sell, offer for, for sale, buy, sell. That's a pretty boring business workflow. Um, and really it's, it's not really um, a workflow. What it is is buying and selling an asset. So we also built a module, our tradability module, which allows um, you to mint tokens, offer them for sale, authenticate them, verify authentication, trade them, the typical stuff that you, that you would expect for just traditional products, but also um, non-fungible tokens or NFTs um, from a blockchain perspective. So really, we allow businesses, depending on where they want to start their journey, to either start it from the raw materials standpoint and move downstream, or start it from the aftermarket verifiability and tradability standpoint and move back upstream. You can really start whatever story you want to tell. We have a module to, to, uh, to, to support you. So um, I hope these definitions are kind of, um, they're helpful. It's really easy to get them convoluted when we're talking about traceability and really all you want is a proof point behind a claim. That's a lot easier than, than full traceability. And that's something that companies also like to jump on too. So how do I get started? Well, it's easy. Just give somebody the bare minimum, which is show me the proof that your stuff is organic. And then, which is a claim, which is a proof point behind a claim. Or you can then go into the full digital transformation of, of tracking all of your ingredients. So there's different ways to start, different levels of effort. And uh, I hope that's helpful for you all. So if we go to the next slide, the reason we built these modules is because we see a paradigm shift in consumer behavior from a value-driven consumer, which is worried about price and convenience, to a purpose-driven consumer aligned with sustainability. They wanna see, you can see these uh, very easily with the statistics that are showing here. 79% of consumers today state that it's important for brands to provide guaranteed authenticity, like certifications when they're purchasing goods. And this is a, this is a survey done by a legitimate um, organization, the National Retail Federation, along with IBM with like 19,000 participants. So this is not a small survey. So if we're talking about 79% of consumers also demanding uh, authenticity, but also almost nearly the same percentage willing to pay more, an average premium of 30, 37% premium for those products, you can think about that in two different ways. The first way is, wow, there is, if you take all of consumer goods, for example, of you know trillions and trillions of dollars, and you, you times that by 0.37%, that's what consumer products are, are leaving on the table right now because they can't prove these claims that, that, that they wanna make. Even though half their supply chain is organic, they don't know whether the other half is, and that means they can't put the, the label on the box and they can't command a premium. So there's a whole bunch of money, just it's, it's roughly 996 billion euros, which is a little bit more than a trillion USDs. Um, and that's from an Accenture report. So another legitimate publication. So you can either think about it from a leaving it on the table standpoint, or you can think of it as of, oh my goodness, there's a lot of products that are making these claims that can't back it up easily. Maybe it's true, but they can't back it up, which means consumers are not going to be willing to pay that premium very soon, which means there's a fear factor of, oh my goodness, I might be missing out on this premium and my margin could shrink overnight because there's other brands that can make those claims and consumers are going to vote with their wallet. So these are pretty scary statistics, especially for the current IT structure and systems that companies are, are typically um, using today. And they're not elastic enough, they're not agile enough um, to handle what's coming, which is the demand for the consumer from a value-driven consumer to a purpose-driven consumer. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So let's, I want to tell you a little story to make this uh, sink in. But first, um, I want to ask you a question. And that is, um, what global 100 most sustainable corporation in the world was ranked number two? 
and I think it's going to blow your mind. Obviously, there's a million of these surveys out there. So, um, you know, take this for a grain of salt, but this is a legitimate publication. So if we go to the next slide, the answer is it's Gucci, baby. I didn't think you thought that was coming, although unless you saw the, uh, the logo on, logo on the, 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 the prior slides bag, um, they're winning the market. Uh, it's serious growth. Obviously, luxury goods have taken a hit because of COVID, but COVID aside, their growth year over year has been absolutely tremendous because they're focusing on the consumer's wants and needs. So for those of you who don't know, Gucci is part of the Caring Group. It's a powerhouse in luxury industry. They're one of the top three houses on the planet. Um, in 2017, the president and CEO, um, uh, Marco, outlined Gucci's 10-year culture of purpose sustainability plan. In, 19, in 2018, they joined the Fur Free Alliance. In 2019, they gave a million euros um, as a founding partner of UNICEF's Girl Empowerment Initiative. In 2019, they announced the emissions offset plan um, to offset their uh, emissions by half by 2025 from its supply chains uh, to become carbon neutral. So we're talking about a group we typically um, think of as somebody walking down a runway with a very expensive bag, half of us on this call would never even consider purchasing, um, as now becoming and recognized as one of the most sustainable companies around. Um, I think you probably thought this, I was going to say Patagonia, because Patagonia is now called Patagucci, Patagucci because it's expensive luxury. Um, so we're not only seeing legacy companies responding to consumers and really benefiting from this, we're also seeing new, new-ish um, luxury goods companies, which I would consider Patagonia, responding to the consumer in a similar but different way. Both telling the same story a little bit differently and both benefiting uh, tremendously from a shift in the market. So um, as part of the Caring Group, Gucci is encouraged and challenged by the group uh, to deal with sustainability issues. And since Caring, Caring has been um, tracking and, and analyzing all of their brand's environment in, environmental impact for years, this was a little bit easier for them. But I think this was, this was a shock when I came across this. Um, and it's been one of the use cases that I've been focusing on because it really tells a story of not only these new brands that are coming up to disrupt these old dinosaurs, but these old dinosaurs are these old dogs learning a new trick. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, what they're really showing here is, is just transition. Uh, sustainability equals revenue. Um, uh, Gucci is absolutely killing it. And according to um, uh, the CEO of Caring Group, Gucci's parent company, millennials and Gen Z account for nearly 50% of Gucci's total sales. So that's probably a shock too. Um, we think normally, you know, our, our grandparents were walking around with Gucci if, if they were lucky enough to, <laughs> or you saw other people's grandparents walking around with this stuff. But this is not something that traditionally, you know, millennials or Gen Z would even go after, but they're nailing the market. They're responding to these consumers' demand, these purpose-driven consumers that want to see sustainability messages, that want to see people join the Fur Free Alliance, that want, to, that want to prove the fact that they've done all of this, and now they're demanding more and more. Certificates of authenticity, verifiable proof of ownership, verifiable genuinity, all of this stuff is coming down the pipeline extremely, extremely fast. And they've been rewarded for this. So the sales were up 16% last year. That's probably taken a dive because of COVID. Um, and they doubled sales since uh, in, the, in the period of 2016 to 2019. That's like unheard of for a brand that size, billion dollar plus brand. Okay, if we go to the next slide. Um, I changed this last minute because this, I think this is a bit wrong. Um, I say luxury doesn't equal exclusivity because these Gen Z and millennials um, aren't necessarily buying luxury because it's exclusive, but they're really buying it because they have a passion um, and these brands have a purpose and they're buying into that, um, feeling good about the fact that they are. And it's a good quality product, which means a lot of these folks are going to sell this on the secondary market eventually. There's a booming industry of secondary markets that, that have, have appeared and I'll talk about that um, in the next slide. But um, luxury goods, secondary market, actually it's this slide. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading my notes on the side. Uh, luxury goods, secondary market is a $24 billion um, industry right now. It's growing four times faster than the traditional market. Meaning that where the growth is, isn't selling this stuff the first time, it's selling it the second time and the third time and the fourth time. And brands right now barely have the infrastructure to sell this the first time and prove any of the stuff that I was talking about before, let alone managing a circular economy supply chain, which is something that we can talk about in another chat. But um, it starts getting crazy when you, when you think about how, how brands can sell something that one time, but 10 times uh, with almost zero marginal cost. Um, and the last point is the circular economy is here. Um, the, the statistics of the fact that it's growing, the secondary market is growing 4X, the traditional market is something you can't ignore. Um, that's an astronomical number in retail. Um, the issue is, if you go to the next slide, um, how are companies going to be responding to this? 
Unfortunately, right now, they can't. I should have capitalized this and bolded this. Um, a study from, by the Sustainability Consortium found that 81% of the 1,700 companies surveyed lacked full visibility into the CSR practices of their supply chain, and 54% had no visibility at all. That is an absolutely terrifying statistic when your consumers are knocking down the door, begging you and actually demanding you for this information to buy, and you have no idea how to respond because you have zero visibility um, into your supply chain. Over 50% have zero visibility. That, that, that's mind blowing. Um, so using Gucci as an example and a surprise, how can other companies learn from them and start tracking this stuff today so that by the time it's, it's an absolute table stake, they can respond. And I think that's what we're talking about or, or the problem that we're trying to tackle um, uh, from a train perspective. So if we go to the last slide, uh, um, this is some of the companies that um, have been responding to their customers that Trium has been working with. If you look on the left side, it's, it's a company called Holy Cow. They are a luxury skincare company that is bringing ingredient transparency to the consumer. So if you have your iPhones or Androids out or anything with a QR code reader, you can actually scan all these and go through um, the experience and see what um, ingredient transparency looks like. You can also see with um, hemp traceability, which we did, which we built an entire agricultural track and trace platform uh, with a company called Verified Organic. Um, we're tracking thousands um, of activities, hundreds of farms, 10,000 acre plus um, of, of agriculture. And we're moving very fast into the wheat space, into the ancient grain space, into the marijuana space, into to a whole bunch of other organic and sustainable supply chains in agriculture with this platform. And the last is memorabilia tradability. So we talked, I talked a little bit about in the beginning about collectability. Um, uh, Sacramento Kings is an NBA basketball team in the US. Um, they're going to be part of the bubble if that's even still happening um, in Florida. So I don't, you know, who knows how long that's gonna be around, but um, we were tracking game worn jerseys. So if you're thinking about your favorite sports team watching them and your favorite player is having a good game, you can actually bid live on their jersey. And along with that jersey comes a certificate, a digital certificate of authenticity. It comes a digital uh, token of ownership. And the next step is for the secondary market of this to absolutely explode. So you're going to buy this jersey. You're going to want to sell it. You'll be able to instantaneously sell it, not try to hawk it on eBay along with the other 50 fakes or 500 fakes. Um, there, there's a number here that, that I've come across many times, but I feel silly citing because I can't believe it could be true, but um, it is it is cited often that 90% of sports memorabilia is fake. That means basically if you buy something, you have a 10% 10% chance that that certificate of authenticity is real. The person that you're buying from actually owned it first and that, that it's genuine. And that is an opportunity that I've, I've maybe never seen um, in, in my adult life. So um, I think we've got 10 minutes left exactly. If you go to the last slide, it has, um, it has all the information from uh, myself, if you want to email me, I will put my email in the chat right now. And I see some questions coming in. Um, if Peter, you want to start rattling them off, I can certainly get them. I'll I'll um I'll manage the the um, question time because Peter's setting okay, up. Okay, perfect. Breakout rooms, and thank you so much, Tyler. That's been a really fascinating talk. So I think before we start questions, we'll all just give you a quick clap. <laughs> um, yep. And then yes, we've. Got a few questions as as you mentioned. Uh, so Peter was saying that can a company make money out of the secondary market, um, so the resale market for their products? And Erathio commented on that, saying that you know traditional argument for buying Apple has been its um, the resale value. A perfect question. Um, I think absolutely. So I think this is going to be a two phased approach. The first approach is that if you eliminate fakes in the marketplace, you decrease supply whether it's legitimate supply or illegitimate supply, the people that want to buy an Apple computer that are now buying God knows what with an Apple um, case on it, or somebody who wants to buy a Gucci bag and is settling for a secondary market that's, that's fake and that you know, they're, they're taking a risk because it's 50 or $100 cheaper, that's going to dry up because consumers are going to demand that certificate of ownership and authenticity before they make a, make a purchase. And I think all of the platforms that are emerging, like the Real Reels and the Poshmarks and the eBay luxury uh, department, what they're going to do is now they're, they're, they are not going to accept these, um, these goods unless they have both of those things, authenticity and ownership. So if you eliminate supply, what you're going to end up doing is you, the, the, the used market prices are going to go up. And then there's going to be a decision by a customer that's going to say, well, do I really want to buy used or do I want to buy the new thing? Because it's 
you know, marginally more expensive. I know that Apple, they do refurbishments, but the discounts even not, not that heavy. So I think Apple's done a pretty good job at, um, at creating that, that secondary market from themselves from refurbished. Um, but not really done a good job protecting fakes, um, in the marketplace and computers are a bit different because you can, you can see if they work when they turn on, but you know, a luxury handbag or something that doesn't have any electrical components is a bit difficult or difficult to, um, uh, to kind of figure out. So that's phase one. Phase two is that if you can program assets, you can program whatever you want. So you can have a whitelist of, um, of retailers and resellers that are able to sell your product to eliminate, totally eliminate gray markets. Um, if you do that, yeah, your, your price, you can, you can command like incredible prices. But what you can also do is you can say that anytime a asset is traded, um, this is going to all happen within smart contracts atomically. So I give you my ownership token and you give us digital currency, whether it's DAI or ether or some sort of, um, uh, some sort of, um, national currency, digital national, national currency. And when the token and the money is in the same contract, it swaps, you know, and, and I get the token and you get the money. And when that happens, you can program something that says, and 10% of that goes back to the, the original company. So they can benefit without absolutely doing, doing absolutely nothing. But I guess there's a third phase too. The third phase is, is absolutely nuts, which means I can start emailing tokens, not people, but the actual token, um, certain incentives. And as a user, I'll be able to, to look up those, those emails, the tokens, it's the best way I can explain it. Um, it says, we will give you 30% off your new iPhone, which Apple already does. Uh, but all these other brands don't do this. And if you have a secondary sale, they totally lose touch with who that person that they're trying to, um, trying to uh, email now. But now they, they, have that, that they have that channel. They have that one, one relationship with a token, not the actual user. So they can email that and say, hey, listen, for a 30% um, discount, buy the newest one and give us the old one. And then we'll refurbish it and sell it. So you can feel good that yours is going to be resold and you can upgrade to something new and beautiful. Um, and you can actually track that refurbished one so that you can hold us accountable to make sure that that goes back in the market. And now we can start seeing people get really, really invested in companies to the point where they'll have ownership in the, in the form, whether it's stock or uh, tokens or whatever, you'll start seeing more co-op like companies because you want to be a part of these, these wonderful, beautiful moving organisms and supply chains will go out the window and it'll be supply mesh. So long answer to your question, but, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a little late here, so I thought I could go on a little rampage. <laughs> no, that, that, thank you very much for elaborating on that, because that then also talks to the comment that Alessia made regarding heavy instruction equipment, yep. um, you know, where uh, manufacturers have profited from secondary and resave markets for a long time, because typically you're not going to go out and buy, buy a tractor every day. So it's a bit different to your Apple, which is a more sort of consumer, um, you mm -hmm. know, consumable product than, than those bigger ones. But the thing that I was interested in is your comment about um, the consumer being sort of more um, moving from value driven to purpose driven. But then that has also got to surely link across to the ability to be able to um, make those sort of purchases. So, you know, like so what I'm thinking is it, it needs to almost be like in the context of what the economy is at the moment. So if we look at what has happened with COVID with people, I'm not sure whether they're, they're employed and that sort of thing, you may have that desire to um, go down the, the sort of um, purpose driven doing the right thing, but um, the desire to do something, the ability to do something may be two completely uh, different things. So I'd be interested to know how those figures as well and the stats might look if if a survey was done now or how that those sort of issues can be tr be handled i suppose i think that's a fantastic question um i would be interested in seeing the, the survey results as well and, but i think i think the point of the 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 value driven consumer is that price is it so they're willing to buy an apple that was doused in pesticides because it's cheaper and i think um we as a consumer group have wised up to the fact that we are going to buy one organic apple rather than two pesticides apples. And I think that instead of buying a shirt for, you know, $3, we'll buy a shirt for $5. It's said that that is organic or that is, or instead of buying a shirt that's new for $5, we'll buy a used organic shirt for $2. So I'm not sure if, if the goods will be priced lower 
um, in a secondary market or in the circular economy market, but I would imagine that participating there has immense benefits. So it's a good, I think that's a great economic question, to be honest, way, way above my pay grade, something I need to learn more about, I guess, but um, I don't have a good answer for you. That, that's good. Yeah, it, it's just interesting, yeah. you know, like what you want to do and what you're able to do, is depending on your, you know, situation with just putting food oh. on the table and that sort of thing. Are you? <laughs> Hopefully it's so, not as binary as that, right? But, um, mm -hmm. but certainly, yeah, certainly more, more price conscious um, folks right now. Um, but I don't know. That's a good, that's a good question. Let's take this offline. Let's, let's, uh, let's slack about this later. That's a good that question. Sounds like a good idea. And also Arafio is keen to also look into, you know, the concept of, you know, you, you've got something maybe that's uh, been verified through the supply chain, but then uh, one part might be changed. Then, you know, how, how do you work that? So it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, this, 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 yeah, the simple answer is, um, you have complete provenance and traceability. So if I, if I have a, um, a handbag and the handle gets um, changed out from, from leather to hemp, um, and I get that done at Gucci, and Gucci does that, there's going mm -hmm. to be a, a tech that does that or, or a, um, a person that works for Gucci that does that who certifies that they've done it. They've taken pictures on a certain date. They've uploaded that pictures. They've uploaded that it's certified organic hemp, uh, the, um, uh, the proof point behind that claim. And now that is, you know, time stamped immutably on the supply chain with a cryptographic signature from a, an address that you can trace back through a Merkle tree back to Gucci's, you know, main hash, hash reference. So that's how it's going to be done in the future. Um, and we're, we're actually doing that today with, with the jerseys and, and a couple other items. So just like the Carfax, I'm not sure if you guys have Carfax in, in Australia, but um, there's going to be plenty of, um, of, of, I don't know, um, maintenance history items or provenance history items or chain of custody of almost everything that we have. It's going to be a daily thing um, because you're going to get more for your money later. So you're, you're, a price is not a price anymore. A price is what you want to, what you pay now, but not as what you're going to get later. So it's really hard to sell stuff right now. Some people are really great at it. I'm terrible at it. I got a whole closet full of stuff that I would love to sell. I can't do it because I'm too lazy or whatever. It's not easy. I don't think that people are going to trust me that it's authentic. It's I got to meet somebody. It's, 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 it's a mess, but now companies are emerging to make this very easy. And if you have that maintenance history, people are going to buy your stuff. They're going to buy you 10 out of 10 times over somebody else. And that, that, that uh, practice is just going to catch on um, and start mandating. It's going to be mandated by certain platforms and then it's going to be part of our daily lives, which I think is going to be wonderful. Um, so yeah, I think right at the moment, right at the last minute. We are. We are. So thank you very much, um, or Sandra for facilitating and Tyler for your very insightful talk. So thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah. Stay safe. So, um,